the Mendip Hills. A wonderful and distinct part of Somerset's rich and varied landscape. Rising up from the Somerset levels down at sea level, this dramatic range of limestone hills must surely offer the finest views in the county. On a clear day, you can look across the levels to the south, the Quantock Hills away to the west, and to the north, the Severn Estuary, with Wales just beyond. The geology of the Mendips is dominated by that of limestone, laid down in the early Carboniferous period, around 325 to 350 million years ago. This bedrock is not just visible in the stone outcrops and dramatic gorges, like at Cheddar, but also along 400 kilometres of dry stone walls, which are a prominent feature right across the hills. And it's also the limestone soluble nature that gives rise to its network of caves underground, with Mendips Hills concealing the largest underground river system in Britain. At a number of locations, such as here at Blackdown, the limestone has been eroded, revealing in turn the much older Devonian sandstone, creating this lovely, wild, rare lowland heath. Now here you can find plants like gorse, heather and bilberry in abundance. This unique and varied geology across the hills creates an array of different habitats including species-rich calcareous grasslands, acid heaths, ancient broadleaf woodland, extensive water bodies and vast expanses of scrub. These important habitats are, in turn, home to a diverse mix of rare and threatened wildlife, with the Mendip Hills famed for everything from adders to oil beetles and cheddar pinks to greater horseshoe bats. As someone who lives just a stone's throw from the Mendips, I know how much they mean, not just to me, but to the thousands of people who come to enjoy all that the hills have to offer. But managing large visitor numbers to certain key sites can, at times, be a delicate balancing act. Jim Hardcastle is manager for the Mendip Hills National Landscape and along with his team is tasked with working alongside the various landowners to best protect and conserve the national landscape's most important habitats and the iconic species they contain. So Jim, explain what a national landscape is. So these are, are big areas of the landscape that were deemed so special that they should have a national protection. So all those big areas of the countryside that we know, like Dartmoor, Exmoor, Lake District and so on, they became our national parks because they were big enough to absorb lots of recreation. The other kind of longer list were turned into areas of outstanding natural beauty, which has now become as, as national landscapes. So you've got national parks and national landscapes. So we're standing in the middle of Mendip Hills National Landscape. How big mm -hmm. is it and does it have clear boundaries? Yeah, yeah, so we're, we're small, but we'd like to think we're perfectly formed. So for it ranges, so it's 198 square kilometres from Western Supermare all the way over to Wells, over the top of Mendip, scoops in the two lakes of Chew and, and Blagdon, and then back along the sort of the ridge line uh, back to Western. And it's really distinctive, the Mendip Hills, because you've got very flat land either side, you know, Somerset levels and North Somerset levels, and then this huge spur of stone, this big limestone ridge that, that kind of that cuts through the landscape and you know when you're on Mendip because of that landscape, because of the geology. So what proportion of the national landscape is designated solely for wildlife conservation? Yeah. So it's, it's about 30% of the land is dedicated, just, so, just as you say, purely for conservation. Because you've got to bear in mind, this is our landscape designation. But, you know, we've got 172 scheduled monuments that we know of up here, 3,000 caves up here. So it's the sum of its parts. It's all those really special bits added together that makes you know you're on you know, you're in a really special landscape up here. And what about the other 70%? So that's uh, predominantly farmland or, or open access land. It just might not have a conservation designation put on it. Still really important for wildlife, really important you know, field margins and field boundaries, the dry stone walls and hedges, large forestry areas and so on. So they're still a really important part of that mosaic. They might just not be the jewels in the crown. So who manages all these really important wildlife sites mm. on Mendip Hills? So 
National landscape teams, we don't own any land. Uh, we manage a little bit on behalf of Somerset Council, but all the conservation areas, the, the nature reserves are looked after by the trusts, the you know, National Trust, Somerset Wildlife Trust, Avon Wildlife Trust, Butterfly Conservation Trust, the Woodland Trust, and they do incredible work on all of their nature reserves. And it's our job to coordinate all of that and bring it together for the benefit of wildlife. But a recent State of Nature report has revealed that just over 40% of these sites are in poor condition. I think actually from, a, from sites of special scientific interest, we're not doing too bad compared to the broad areas of the countryside, but a lot of those impacts are beyond our control. You know, climate change and so on, traffic pollution, uh, housing developments. It's habitat fragmentation, and so that means broad areas being cut off from each other. So there's a really good example of, you know, around the adders. They need to spread out from away from their, their overwintering sites so they can mix with other populations and get a more diverse gene pool going. If they can't, you get inbreeding and, and populations can crash. So the biggest thing is, is fragmentation. We need to join all these habitats up. And it is these factors that have a cumulative effect on the species they house. And how can you work to turn this juggernaut around with the mm. nature recovery plan that you've put in place? Mm -hmm. We gravitated towards the farmers and landowners that are doing really good things. Well, firstly, we produced a state of nature report. So that was a kind of a baseline assessment of, of all that we have and sort of what condition is it in. And then the nature recovery plan. And then they can see where their patch of land is, where their nature reserve is in the overall plan and then it's broken down by all the champion species and all the actions that hopefully will help nature recover in this area. Because I think we've moved away from, from just conservation, we need to help nature recover now. So it's not a nature conservation plan, it's a nature recovery plan. So what are the challenges faced by landowners and policy makers charged with making decisions? There's some great landowners that we work with. Some of them are you know, really leading the way with regenerative agriculture and different types of grazing and so on. That's, they really understand how to manage the soil and, and manage the land for, for wildlife. And when we introduce that person to another one, another farmer, maybe a couple of miles away that, that's really interested but needs a little bit of convincing, then we can see those great ripples spread. One of the other special qualities is, you know, this is a landscape that's been used for adventure and, and recreation and wildlife watching for many, many years. Uh, and we can see the visitor numbers going up steadily. Uh, and certainly during lockdown, we had a real spike of visitors. So we're trying to manage people away from those honeypots. And, and there's some simple ways of doing that. The, the literature and the information we put out, we don't talk about some of the nature reserves. We direct people to where there's you know, big car parks and good infrastructure, good path networks around them. So that's much better to absorb it. And we don't talk about some other areas. They're still on the Ordnance Survey map. If you find them, amazing, and you will have a, a great time. So there's some subtle things like that. And even in some of the nature reserves, we can do some very subtle things around some of our, our more precious adder habitats we leave strips of bracken that dogs don't go through it's a really subtle little bits of management like that the main thing is we've got 15 uh, visitor counters hidden away on all the rights away network so we're pretty good at monitoring how many people go where uh, and then we give that to the land managers and the landowners so they can adjust the way they they manage the area for themselves An important facet of this plan involved the selection of eight champion species across the Mendip Hills. Now these species had to fulfil three criteria. Firstly, they had to be species of conservation concern. Secondly, they needed to be indicators of healthy habitats. And finally, they had to be species that were charismatic or memorable. For the Mendip Hills, the champion species are the adder, black oil beetle, cheddar pink, greater horseshoe bat, hazel dormouse, skylark, small pearl bordered fritillary, and water vole. To help achieve their recovery, a species action plan has been created for each. But you also have a part to play in helping keep the Mendip Hills so special. Firstly, come and enjoy all the Mendip Hills have to offer, but do so responsibly by following the Countryside Code. Be considerate to those living in, working in and enjoying the countryside. Leave gates and property as you find them. Don't block access to gateways or driveways when parking. 
be nice and say hello to those sharing the space. Follow signs and keep to mark paths unless wider access is available. I do hope you enjoyed this film exploring the fabulous natural heritage of the Mendip Hills and crucially how to help protect it. If you'd like to find out more then visit the Mendip Hills website and also check out our eight champion species films. Thanks for watching.